Hello everyone, this is the Hesse A Square Anatomy and Physiology Review. Go ahead and like the video, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with a classmate who you know may be taking the Hesse soon. Let's get started. Far as what you can expect, you will be given 30 multiple choice questions and you will have 25 minutes to answer those questions. Of course, that varies depending on the institution you decide to test at. You will be tested on atomical planes, atomical directions, and atomical terminology. You need to know the 11 systems of the body. They will test you thoroughly on that topic. Now on the HESI, you need to know just like the basics of medical term and a little bit of A&P or anatomy terminology. You have to do things, y'all, to make yourself remember these words. For instance, pedal means foot. You can think about a pedal of on a bike. You know, you put your foot on the pedal or a pedicure. You have to do things or say words and make up these mnemonics to help you remember because y'all know these words. It's like learning another language. And essentially it is because most of medical terminology is based in Latin and Greek. So anyway, let's go on to the next one. Another region I forgot to mention was the abdominal pelvic region. And this is consists of the abdominal area and the pelvic area, like collectively. So it's consisted of four quadrants, okay? The upper and lower and the left and right quadrants. So you might need to know what organs are in each quadrant. So just take some time to look over that as well as use multiple resources. First, our abdominal pelvic regions, we have about nine of those. So just take some time to look over those and just like know where they are, know where they're located, okay? The planes of the body. Now, you wanna take some time to understand the planes of the body, not just like visually, but understand where or how they're like separated. You'll be asked questions about the planes of the body, like what, plane it like divides the body into an upper and lower half or some derivative of that okay so we have our frontal plane which is if you were to turn and if you were facing in an atomical position and atomical position if you're just standing in the front with your hands supine and supine just means facing forward and your feet together you're standing in an atomical position if you were to turn 90 degrees and then slice your body from back to front you'll be happy this is a, a frontal plane or a coronal plane some people say coronal but i prefer to say frontal next we have our mid sagittal plane our mid sagittal plane is that plane directly in the middle of the body it's directly in the middle and it also has different names some people just say sagittal but uh, we're going to say mid-sagittal, okay? Because we also have perisagittal in pink. Perisagittal is just kind of like in the middle, but a little bit off to the side, that type of plane, okay? Um, we have oblique plane. Oblique is like the odd plane. Oh, odd. Think of that. That's the odd plane. It's like odd. It's not like any other ones. It's just, it's, I would say weird. It's, it's just weird it, okay that's all i can say transverse or horizontal plane as the plane where it divides the body into the upper and lower regions okay so you want to take some time to look over the atomical directions i wanted to include that this is not my image by the way but i thought it was really cool for you guys to understand these different directions because that will be on the exam if you have taken your a&p classes honestly you should be fine on anatomy and physiology uh, section if you have not i will study throw because an a&p y'all it contains a lot of information so now i'm going to talk about the organ systems and organs and partly cells and tissues we'll talk a little bit about cells and tissues but not too much and we'll do that by starting with the um, 11 body systems Let's do that. So then we have the four tissues, the four main tissues of the body, epithelial, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscle tissue. So know that. Now we're going to talk about the integumentary system. This is composed of the skin, the hair, the nails, and associated glands like our sweat glands. Um, the skin is the largest organ in the human body, y'all, and its main function is to regulate body temperature, so fluid maintenance. This is why we sweat, okay, through the equine sweat glands. It also makes vitamin D. That's why we go outside to absorb the energy from the sun because it helps us to make vitamin D. And some scientists may argue and say that it actually 
doesn't just gives us vitamin D. But anyway, it also detects stimuli, and that's like your senses. Like when you feel something crawling on your skin, that is the function of your integumentary system. So now we have the layers of skin: stratum conium, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum stratum spinosum and stratum basal from our superficial layer to the deep and remember the mnemonic come let's get sunburn which will help you to remember the different layers in that order going from superficial to deep and next we have the epidermis say up the layer of the skin and then we have the dermis which contains all of the blood vessels and then we have the hypothermis which is also called the subcutaneous layer and that is consistently mostly of our blood vessels and also adipose tissue so now we're talking about the skeletal system the main component or the periosteum bones cartilage joints and ligaments the main function of the skeletal system is to provide structure and support for the body and that support protects our organs okay uh, the skeletal system is also responsible for movement and not really the bones but mostly our joints okay it produces red and white blood cells um it stores minerals so highlighted in green, we have our exoskeleton and then our appendicular skeleton highlighted or in yellow or beige, okay? So the trunk and the head in the trunk consists of the exoskeleton and the rest of the body, the limbs mostly is the appendicular skeleton. So on the HESI, you will be asked about basic anatomy. So if you have taken your A&P classes already, you should be fine. But if you have not, I will use multiple resources i try to like like put a lot of anatomy on this video but y'all it was like really hard because you know amp is a lot but anywho i wanted to touch basically on the vertebrae i do recall a few questions on the hassie that asked about it the vertebrae is composed of 33 bones called vertebrae and they are divided into regions first we have our cervical region this is the neck area cervical region is composed of seven bones uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, etc. Now C1 and C2 are important. C1 is our atlas, C2 is our axis, and they are co cohesive together. They are responsible for neck movement. They are the ones that's responsible for neck movement, C1 and C2. Now we have a thoracic vertebrae, which is composed of 12 bones. Lumbar is com uh, lumbar vertebrae is composed of five. Now the mnemonic or whatever you want to call it that helps you to remember the bones that that are contained in each region or having coffee at 7 a.m. That's what you do, right? And then we have tea at 12 p.m. for lunch. And then we have L liquor for the lumbar region. We have that at 5 p.m. Now that'll help you remember the bones that are in each region. But then we have our sacrum that's below the lumbar vertebrae and then our coccyx. Uh, which is basically the tailbone. And next we have the muscular system. The function of the muscular system is that it provides movement um, by means of heating up our muscles. It also gives us posture and once again it produces heat. Now components are skeletal muscle, tissues, smooth and also cardiac muscle. And now the difference between tendons and ligaments. Tendons connect muscle to bone and ligaments bone to bone. The nervous system. The main functions of the nervous system is to basically control all mental facilities. It is called the control center. It controls movements, thoughts, autotomic responses. It generates action potentials, regulates body activities, detects changes in the body environment, causes muscular contractions, helps all parts of the body communicate with each other. It uses electrical and chemical means to do this. Basically, it's, it's the control center. And the main compartments are the brain, spinal cord, nerves, special senses, such as the eyes and ears. Here's some basic anatomy that you can touch on and just like study. CNS versus PNS. Central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord and is responsible for integrating sensory information and responding. Now the PNS or peripheral nervous system is made up of all the other nerves that are connected to parts, other parts of the body. And basically they're all the nerves that the CNS is not composed of. It sends information from different areas of the body to the brain. It carries out command from the I brain. Model and the labyrinth is found in the ear. Hence that we talked about the ear model, that little section here, that's the labyrinth. So let's get started on some of the basic. 
So this area here is the posterior, well this whole thing is the posterior view. We'll get to the anterior view pretty soon. So this is the posterior semicircular canal. This is the posterior semicircular duct. And the ring that you, well ring like structure here, back here is the lateral semicircular. This is the anterior semicircular canal, it's only the white part. And this is the label number six is the anterior um, semicircular duct. So next we have the endolymphatic sac. And then all the way down, the one that's labeled number three, I don't know if you can see that. But the one that's labeled number three is the uticular saccular, uticular saccular, utricular saccular, excuse me. <laughs> And this one here, labeled number nine, is our sacral, sacral. And here is the saccular nerve. So this little bobby looking circular area here that's connected to the semicircular um, canal, posterior semicircular canal. This is the ampulla of the semicircular canal. And this is the ampullary nerve. So let's start with this one right here. This is a utricle, utricle, and this is a utricular nerve, both of these. So utricular, utricular nerve, utricle and utricular nerve, excuse me. So this is a vestibular galen, vestibular galen, and this is a vestibular nerve. So this here, number, label number 12, is the cochlea which is right here. So let's get a be better look at the cochlea. It would be considered number five, the cochlea. And then we have one more structure to name. It's uh, the oval. It's labeled number, um, well, not a number, A. It's right there. It's the oval window. Yeah. And that is pretty much it for the basic part of the labyrinth, which is found in the ear. The endocrine system. Its main function is to release hormones. Some components are the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, thymus gland, the parathyroid gland, the adrenal gland, the pancreas, ovary, and the testes. So speaking of the pituitary gland, it is composed of the anterior and posterior pituitary. In the anterior pituitary, it is composed of five different cell types that secrete seven different types of hormones. For an example, the cell type somatotrope produces or secretes human growth hormone in bones, muscles, and organs. And then next we have latotropes, which produces prolactin and milk production in women who are pregnant or nursing. Next we have gonadotropes. These produce the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone, and they do different things. But in the testy, it produces testosterone, and in the ovaries, it produces estrogen and progesterone. Next, we have thyroid tropes. Thyroid tropes is responsible for secreting thyroid stimulating hormone, and thyroid stimulating hormone produces T3 and T4. Next, we have the cortical tropes, which produces the adrenal cortical traffic hormone, ATCH, and the melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH. Next, we have the posterior pituitary, and it produces oxytocin, which produces uterine contractions and milk ejection in women. Now, let me bring, let me bring you back. So, the anterior pituitary produces latotropes, which produces prolactin, which is milk production. But however, the posterior pituitary produces oxytocin, OT, which also does a little bit, thing, it does a little bit similarity to what the latotropes does, but this is for milk ejection. That's different from milk production. So I just have to point that out there. So that is in women, of course. And the next hormone that the posterior pituitary gland secretes is the antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And that will be regarding the, kidney, the kidneys. The lymphatic and immunity system. Its main function is to return proteins and lipids to blood. It carries this from the GI tract. It is the site of maturation and profilation of the B and T cells. It essentially defends the body against pathogens. The system is also composed of a network of lymphatic vessels that carry clear fluid called lymph. And which brings us to some components, lymphatic fluid, vessels, the spleen, thymus, lymph nodes, the tonsils. So of course, this is also talking about the B and T cells as well. 
the respiratory system. Its main function is gas exchange. It transfers oxygen from inhaled air to blood, where we take CO2 or carbon monoxide from blood to exhale air. Basically, we're breathing in to get oxygen and we're breathing out to get rid of CO2. It uh, also helps with the acid base balance of body fluids and some components of the respiratory system are the lungs, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, and the bronchial tubes. Here is some basic anatomy of the bronchii, so just take some time to look over that. The digestive system. Its main function is to break down food, absorb nutrition, and eliminate solid wastes. Now, the components of the uh, elementary canal are the mouth, pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestines, the anus, and accessory organs such as um, our salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas. Now, the small intestines is responsible for absorbing nutrition or nutrients, and the large intestines is responsible for eliminating solid waste. The urinary system or the renal system. Its main function is that it stores, produce, and eliminates urine. It regulates volume and chemical composition of blood. It helps acid base balance of fluid. Um, it maintains the body's mineral balance, and it also helps regulate production of the red blood cells. The main components are the kidneys, the ureters, the urethra, so and the urinary bladder. So me, and I'm sharing to you guys that will probably help you to remember the differences, um, that urethra ends with an A, and urethra is closer to the bladder, which also has an A in it as well. So you can basically coordinate it like that. And remember like your ureters, I tried the best you guys. I tried my best to draw this perfectly, but I didn't. Okay, so remember that your ureters, you have two of those. It's supposed to be um, a ureter, uh, I was supposed to write ureter here as well, but you have your left ureter and you have your right ureter. Just remember you have two ureters, but then you have one urethra which is below the bladder. And if you're a male, of course, the male urethra is longer, and this is obviously a male. <laughs> and then um, the female urethras would be a lot shorter, like about right, right, right there. The reproductive system. The main function is to make a new organism. It transports and stores gametes. And in women, the mammary glands produce milk. The main components are the testes and ovaries. The testes consist of the epididymis, vas deferens, the seminal vessels, the prostate, and the penis. Now, the women or the ovaries are consist of the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the vagina, and the mammary glands. Now, the testes is where sperm cells are created, and from there, the sperm cells move to the epididymis, which is a structure located on the top of the testes. The epididymis stores sperm cells and has a job of bringing them to maturity so that they'll be able to fertilize eggs from the ovaries. The cardiovascular system main components are the heart, blood, and blood vessels. Speaking of blood, blood carries oxygen, nutrition, and waste. It regulates pH balance, temperature, and water, Blood components such as leukocytes help fight against diseases. In the blood, you will find red blood cells, which is about 44%, white blood cells, which makes up about less than 1%, I'll say, then platelets, which is also 1%, and then we have the plasma, which makes up the majority of blood, coming in at 55%. And in the average human adult body, there's about 1.20 to 1.50 gallons of blood. The leukocytes, they consist of the neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. The neutrophils contain two to five lobes. They kill bacteria, they kill fungi, and kill foreign debris. Now, our lymphocytes have a large singular nucleus. They fight against viruses and make antibodies. Now, they're associated with T cells, NK natural killer cells, and B cells. Monocytes. Monocytes have a U-shaped nucleus. They clean up cell or damaged cell debris. And we have our eosinophils, which has two to five lobes. They contain red to orange granules. They kill parasites, they kill cancer cells, and they help with allergic responses. Next, we have basophils. They have two lobes, and they're said to have an obscure nucleus. This means that it's kind of hidden under a microscope. You won't be able to see it. They are responsible for allergic reactions. They secrete histamine. Blood types. If your blood is O positive, you can give blood to O positive individuals 
A positive, B positive, and AB positive individuals, but you can only receive from O positive and O negative people. If you are A positive, you can give to A positive yourself and AB positive, but you can only receive from A positive, A negative, O positive, and O negative. If your blood is B positive, you can give to B positive individuals and AB positive blood types, but you can only receive from B positive, B negative, O positive, and O negative. If your blood type is AB positive, you can only give to AB positive individuals, but you can receive from all blood types. If you're O negative, you can give to all blood types, but you can only receive from O negative. If your blood type is A negative, you can give to A negative, A positive, AB negative, and AB positive, but you can only receive from A negative and O negative. If the blood type is B negative, you can give to B negative, B positive, AB negative, and AB positive, but you can only receive from B negative and O negative. If your blood type is AB negative, you can give to AB negative and AB positive, but you can only receive from a AB negative and A negative, B negative, and O negative. Now, AB positive is considered to be the universal recipient because it can literally receive blood from all types. And our O negative is considered to be the universal donor because it can give to all blood types. The heart. The heart is a muscular organ located in front of the chest slightly left to the sternum or the breastbone. A rushing heart rate for adults is 60 to 100 beats per minute and in children, 70 to 110 beats per minute. According to the CDC, heart disease is the number one leading death in America, and of 90% of these heart diseases are preventable. The cardiovascular system main function is to pump blood throughout the body. The heart is like a muscular pump, if you will. It circulates blood to the tissue and to the rest of the body. This is important because blood is important. Blood contains nutrition, waste, and oxygen, and without it, our cells cannot survive. The heart is involuntarily, which means that it doesn't need help or any type of signals from the brain to function. For example, if you were to tell your leg to lift up, either leg, it will lift up. It's voluntarily. But if you were to tell your heart to stop, it will not stop because it is involuntary. The oxygenated blood travels to the heart via the superior and inferior vena cava. It fills up the one of four chambers of the heart the right atrium. From there, it has to pass through a tricuspid valve and valves are like doors to the chambers to prevent the backflow of blood. From there, we're going to the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the largest chamber of the heart because it does most of the contracting or pushing. So once the blood is filled in the right ventricle, it passes through the pulmonary semilinear valve. Then it goes to the pulmonary arteries. From the pulmonary artery, it goes into the lungs where most of the gas exchange occurs. From there, the blood is now oxygenated and it travels to the pulmonary veins. From the veins, it goes into the left atrium. Left atrium through the bicuspid or the mitral valve. From there, the left ventricle. Then it goes into the aorta. To the aorta, it goes into the tissues and to the rest of the body. So I wanted to point out that arteries are carrying blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart. Now in the heart illustrations, you may see a lot of times that the arteries are painted blue and the veins are painted red. And this is because we're in the heart now, you know, we're not in any other part of the body. So when you see that the pulmonary artery is painted blue, then know that it is just carrying deoxygenated blood away from the heart. And when you see veins, just know that it's carrying oxygenated blood toward the heart. The electrical conduction system of the heart generates or transmits action potentials or electricity through the atrium and the ventricles. This action potential or electricity gives the contraction to the chambers, which is responsible for pumping the blood throughout the body. The electrical impulses travels from the SA node to the AV node. This is where the impulses are slowed down for a short period of time and then they'll continue on with the bundle branches of his. The bundle branches of his divides into right and left pathways called the bundle branches. Then the left and right branches send electrical signals to the Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers then in turn contracts the ventricles. The electrical recording of this activity is called electrical cardiogram, aka EKG. While reading a normal EKG, 
the first wave you encounter will be the P wave. It signifies the beginning of a cardiac cycle. The P wave is initiated by the SA node and represents atrial depolarization. This is when the heart contracts. Next, the QRS complex. This represents ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization or when the ventricles relax. Three important time periods are the QP interval or sometimes it's called the PR interval, the ST segment and the QT interval. The PR interval represents the total time it requires for the action potential or electricity to travel through the SA node, through the atrial myocardium, the AV node, through the AV bundle, and the right and left bundle branches, and through the Bakunji fibers throughout the entire ventricular myocardium. The ST segment starts at the end of the S wave and ends at the beginning of the T wave. During this period of time, it says that the ventricles are completely depolarized or contracted. It occurs during the plateau phase. The QT interval begins at the Q wave and ends at the T wave. During this period of time, it represents the beginning of the ventricular depolarization and the end of ventricular repolarization. The SA node of the sinoatrial node is called a pacemaker because it initiates the maximum amount of electrical impulses. This is not to be confused with the actual pacemaker of the heart. Pacemaker of the heart is a device that is inserted to help patients with irregular heartbeats or bradycardia. Though they have similar functions, they are not the same. If you're taking your HESI pre-nursing exam, you may want to download this checklist. It contains all subjects we discussed on this channel. You can check off certain subjects and concepts that you felt that you've mastered and certain ones that you need to work on. I recommend having at least one month before your testing day to study. 100 hours a month, three hours a day, or 21 hours a week. To purchase this checklist, check the description box below. All right, everyone, that is pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with a classmate who you know may be taking the HESI, the Kaplan, the T's, or any other pre-nursing exam. Because once again, they're all similar. They contain some of the same information. And y'all go ahead and subscribe to the channel, and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.